Good morning. Good to see you in the Lord's house this morning. Feel like I've been to church already, right? Well, if you have sleeves you can roll up, this would be the time to do it. We are going into six of the deepest chapters probably in the Bible. Very complex. Probably nothing more relevant to our time than chapter 7 through 12 of the book of Daniel. For the next however many weeks that it takes us to finish this book of God's Word, we're going to be studying the Antichrist, the false prophet, the rule, the seven years, everything that I think you'll ever want or need to know. So if you've got your Bibles and you would turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, I'm only going to read the first 10 verses because as I began to put this message together the first of the week, I realized this chapter is just too deep to try to cover in one week. So we're just going to cover the first 10 verses. When you find your place, if you'd stand together with me to let me know you're ready to study God's Word, Daniel chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the backs of the pews, or you can look behind me. They put the words... Over my head. Daniel chapter 7. You ready? Here we go. Earlier, during the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote down the dream and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm turning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the other. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground like a human being. And it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four bird's wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Then in my vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was different than any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I watched his thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothes were as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend to him. Then the courts began its session, and the books were open. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to anoint our time of studying together this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We pray you'd open the hearts of these, your children. Give us the words, Father, you'd have for me to share. Pray you'd anoint us this morning. And just, Father, we put the enemy under our feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I told you a couple of weeks ago that the book of Daniel is not necessarily written specifically from this point forward in chronological order. We are going back in time now to King Belshazzar's reign. I think I told you last week when Daniel's in the lion's den, he's much older, between 80 and 90. In this particular dream, when this took place, Daniel was around 68 years of age. And again, it's King Belshazzar's reign. Daniel's in his bed one night and he has a dream. And in this dream... He, he notices a, ver, a storm coming out of the sea with strong winds. It's blowing in every direction. 
Now we believe this storm or this sea that he sees could have been a couple of things. It could have been the Mediterranean Sea because we know that all four of the empires surround and border the Mediterranean Sea. But also when we look at Revelations and we have to study Daniel and Revelations almost side by side to understand what they're saying. We know that sea can also reference from the sea of humanity or coming out from people. So when you see sea oftentimes you can think of from the sea of humanity. And then I have trouble saying, so he saw a sea, or he sees a sea, and it gets real confusing. But he notices these four bees coming up out of the water. Each one is different from the other. Now, I want you to think back several weeks ago to chapter 2, when we had the statue. You remember the statue. Now, what was the golden head? What empire did it represent? The Babylonian Empire. And then we move down from the head of gold to the shoulders and the arms of silver. And that represented what empire? You got it. The Medo-Persian Empire. Then we move down to the, uh, to the, well I know it's the Greek Empire. I'm trying to think what the statue had. It was a bronze, right? I don't have that in front of me. Bronze. Yeah. And it's, it's the Greek Empire. We're going to get to that. Then we move down to the legs. And that was which empire? The Roman Empire. What we see here in verses basically 4 through 7 is another visual, visual of the same type of dream. Here it comes in beast. Now we're not going to get to the passages this morning. We'll go through them in time in, in the rest of these chapters because I can only focus on subsets this morning of this complex chapter of the Bible. But in verse 4, the lion is the Roman Empire. In verse 5, the second beast that looks like a bear is the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 6 is the Greek Empire. And verse 7 and 8 is the Roman Empire. You go, how do you know that that bear was that empire? Well, if you read further down in the chapter, as many of the chapters of Daniel do, they self-interpret. They tell us. They tell us what it means. So further down in the verses, it will verify that that's what we're noticing. I want to hone in this morning on verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 is where I want to kind of park and camp out and study. We know that verses 7 and 8 is the Roman Empire. Now you remember when we had the statue? There was 10 what on the statue? No, on the statue back in chapter 2. Toes. 10 toes. Wiggle your toes right now as a reminder, 10 toes. Here we're seeing this, this beast with ten horns, representative of the same thing as the ten toes, just a different demonstration. But we get something in this chapter that we did not see with the toes. We see that three of the horns are removed and a fourth horn comes out. Now, in the weeks to come, it will be as clear as mud what this is, but let me just go ahead and tell you what it is. This is the Antichrist. This fourth, or this horn, that is coming out of this beast is the Antichrist. Now, this, it, the, the chapter tells us, if you look at verse 8, it says, And I was looking at the horn, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. In chapters to come, we'll get into that deeper. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I want you to pay close attention. If you underline in your Bible, you can underline a mouth that boasted arrogantly. If we are to understand the purpose and the mission of the Antichrist, we're going to have to go back a little bit and do a little bit of history and research. Let's understand Babylon physically for a moment. Babylon is, a, is the city in all four of the kingdoms. The Roman, the Greek, the Medo-Persian, and the Babylonian Empire. Today, Babylon would be about 50 miles south of Baghdad. Babylon is in the center of the Middle East, and it's a place physically that we should pay close attention to what is going on there. But let's step away from Babylon physically for a moment and let's think about Babylon metaphorically. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelations, chapter 17. 
Revelation chapter 17. And again, what we are trying to figure out this morning or understand is this mouth that boasts arrogantly. What is up with that? Revelation chapter 17. I want to read the first six verses. Here we go. One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns. See the horns? You got it? And blasphemies against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witness for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. So in the book of Revelation, Babylon is called Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. Well, who is this woman? Why is she called Babylon the Great? And why would Babylon be the mother of all prostitutes and obscenities? I have studied and studied and studied and pondered to try to understand this. And I feel like God this week showed me something that I want to share with you. I kept questioning why is in chapter, chapter 17 of Revelation, why does it say Babylon is the mother of all prostitutes? What does that mean? Does it mean it was a prostitution capital of the world, literally? No. Let's go back. Let's go back 1900 years before Daniel. We are at approximately 2400 BC, okay? The flood has just taken place. I want to introduce you to a man by the name of Nimrod who lived in the plains of Shinar. If you would turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 10, we've got to go all the way back to really understand if we're going to grasp what this verse, this passage of Scripture is telling us. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, we find these words. Cush was also the ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior on earth. Since he was the greatest hunter in the world, his name became proverbial. People would say, this man is Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia with the cities of Babylon, Eric, Akkad, and Canal. Now, turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. See, they're probably across the page, or you're turning one page. Genesis chapter 11, the first four verses, we find these words. At one time all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. You remember the story when you was a child of the, the Tower of Babel. The purpose of the Tower of Babel was to study the stars. This was the beginning of astrology in Babylon. Okay? 1900 years before Daniel's day, Babylon is known, they're building a tower to begin astrology. Now, Nimrod had a wife. 
His wife's name was Simarus. Simarus was the first priestess of idolatry. Now let me tell you the legend of Simarus. Simarus gave birth to a son. His name was Tammuz. And according to legend, and I'm going to show you in God's word in a minute, he was conceived by a beam of sunlight. I'm just telling you the story, okay? When Tammuz grew up, he was killed by a wild boar. After 40 days of weeping and fasting, the legend has it that Tammuz came back to life. He was raised from the dead. It is from the legend of Simrus and Tammuz that the cultic worship of the mother and child was birthed. This worship was divine, defined as the mother was later identified as the queen of heaven. I want you to say the queen of heaven with me. Simrus became known as the queen of heaven. Now, 40 days he comes back to life. Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. I'm going to show you this first. Turn with me to Jeremiah 44. 1800 years later after this legend begins of Nimrod and his wife who is what is she known as the queen of what the queen of heaven 1800 years have passed and look at Jeremiah 44 verse 15 what the prophet writes then all the women present and all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to idols a great crowd of all the Judeans living in northern Egypt and southern Egypt answered Jeremiah. Notice what they say. We will not listen to your message from the Lord. We will do whatever we want. We will burn incense and pour out liquid offerings to the queen of heaven just as much as we like. Just as we and our ancestors and our kings and officials have always done in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Where did this begin? It began with Nimrod and his wife all the way back 1800 years later. And they basically look when Jeremiah says, you need to stop this. They basically, we're not going to stop it. We don't care what God says. We're not quitting. We've been doing it for hundreds if not thousands of years. Let's read on. Verse, I'm in the middle of verse 17. For in those days we had plenty to eat and we were all well off and had no troubles. But ever since we quit burning incense to the queen of heaven and stopped worshiping her with liquid offerings, we have been in great trouble and have been dying from war and famine. Besides, the women added, do you suppose that we were burning incense and pouring out liquid offerings to the queen of heaven and making cakes marked with her image without our husbands knowing it? And helping us? Of course not. Many Bible historians tell us that the 40 days of Lent originated with Simrus in the remembrance of her weeping over the death of her son Tammuz. Now turn with me to Ezekiel. What is his son? What's the son's name? Tammuz, right? If I'm not saying it right, just say it wrong with me. Ezekiel chapter 8. Verse 13 and 14. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Y'all hang on with me. We're going to come back to Revelations. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. Verse 13, we find these words. Then the Lord added, Come and I will show you even more detestable sins than these. He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple, and some of the women sitting there some women were sitting there weeping for the God who? Tammuz. This goes back 1800 years, Babylon. At the end of the 40 days of weeping every spring that they did in celebration or remembrance of Tammuz rising from the dead, there was a feast of Ishtar. And in the feast of Ishtar, they gave each other eggs because eggs symbolized new life. Ishtar is where we get our English word. Anybody want to guess? Easter. 
Here's what I want you to get. When Daniel walks into Babylon as a refugee, he is walking into a place that is filled with magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, people around interpreting dreams, watered down religion, they're serving all kinds of gods, men and women are seeking answers from mediums, from the stars, there's all kinds of spiritual guides, it's a society where any kind of God rules, as long as you've got a God. Does that happen to sound familiar to anyone? Daniel walked into Babylon. All kinds of gods. I mean, they had so much junk, you could worship anything. You remember last week, King Darius, when they come in, they just said, you can't pray to any of them. We've got so many gods, we can't list them. But you've got to pray to the king. All right, let's go back. I'm going somewhere. Everybody still with me? Roll your sleeves up. Hang on. Bring a lunch. What is a prostitute? And I'm not trying to be funny. What is a prostitute? A prostitute is a sinful replacement for that which is supposed to be dedicated, committed, and holy. It's a fake of the real thing. It's a fake. Babylon is called a prostitute. Could it be that Babylon is a sinful replacement for what is true and holy? Could Babylon be an apostasy, false teaching, false religion, and watered down beliefs? You see, I believe our greatest threat in this day is not an invasion or nuclear warheads or ISIS. I think our greatest threat is that we do not understand the attack of the little horn and what he is trying to do. The attack of the little horn, and it's ingenious when you think about it, is just to get God's people to water down and become acceptant of everything. Let's just love everybody and accept everything and let's not hold to the truth anymore. Paul writes, let's back this all this up with the Bible. Turn with me on to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we find these words, verse 3. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. This is written to God's people, to a young pastor. We are seeing in our time where there are men and women who are telling people whatever they want to hear in the name of the gospel because that's what people want to hear. Just tell me the good stuff. I don't want to hear the, the, the bad stuff. I don't want to hear the truth. James chapter 4 and verse 4. We find these words, You adulterous people, don't you know that your friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now, with us thinking and believing that the prostitute is apostasy. We've just watered down and let everything go. Turn back with me to Revelation 17 and let's read it with this in mind. And let's see if it kind of opens up something to us. Revelation 17 verse 1, we find these words. One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. Let me paraphrase that with the Keith Jones version. Let me show you the judgment that's coming over the people who have endorsed and accepted this false, fake, idolatry, watered-down, apostic state of religion. Let me show you what's going to happen to those who have not embraced the truth and held on to the truth. Verse 2. The kings of this world have committed adultery with her. Man, they've embraced it. It's what the people wanted. The leader said, let's go for it. Let's just be accepting of everything. And the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. Man, we just love it. 
They're accepting everybody and everything. It don't matter what you think is right or wrong. Any kind of relationship is good. Let me tell our teens because you're not going to hear it in the world. Okay? Now this is about the truth today. And let me tell you something. If we don't want to hear the truth, you've got the wrong pastor. We've got to hear the truth. And the minute somebody stands up here and tells you something is not the truth, you need to go down to the Greyhound bus station and get a ticket and send them on their way because the world has got enough untruth out there. The truth. The truth, teens, is what Bobby and Sherry just sang about. The only people who go to heaven are those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. All other religions and teaching is false and they will burn in hell. That's the truth. Being good people don't send you to heaven. Reading the Bible story don't send you to heaven. Those blood-washed saints who have taken up their cross and are following Jesus are headed to heaven. David Jeremiah, and you can, you can pick this number with him. I was reading just this week in one of his books. He tells the story, and it's, or the number. It's staggering of the number of people in this world who are professing Christians, okay? But when, when they break that down of what they take as a professing Christian to a true blood-washed saint, less than 25%. Now, Jesus backed that up in Matthew. He said, in the last days, they'll come before me and say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all these things? And what did Jesus say? Depart from me. I don't... I don't know who you are. You're not my child. Teenagers, everybody's not going to heaven. Just because they're good people don't mean they're going to heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. The only sexual relationship, teenagers, that you can have is under the confines of a marriage covenant between one man and one woman. Everything else is sexual immorality. Well, he loves men. We're just going to live together. It's sexual immorality and abomination before God. That's the truth. The truth. But on television, everything's okay. Isn't it? It's all okay. And we are being whitewashed into this sons and daughters of God. The truth. And we struggle with our finances because we don't understand. The book of Malachi says when you rob God, you're operating under a curse. We can't figure out why we struggle. The truth. The truth is the church is the body of Christ that he died for. And he's passionately in love with it. And it's important that you support and get involved with the church. That's the truth. The truth. The truth. I was thinking this morning as I was preparing I'm kind of getting ahead of myself but it'll be okay we'll back up and catch up or do something in a minute but I was thinking there's going to be people that's going to be standing in line before God and I believe there's people who believe that everybody's going to stand before God and he's going to go oh yeah just come on in there's heaven we was talking last night with some friends I said when's the last time you've ever told you somebody went to hell I've never made anybody went to hell I've never been to a funeral where somebody told me they went it just don't happen we know they do. And I believe there's going to be people standing in line at the judgment of Christ and they're going to begin to scream out and say, somebody tell me the truth. What's the truth? I've been deceived all of my life. Will somebody tell me the truth? I need to know the truth. What's the truth? Don't trick me. My soul's at stake. Verse 3, so the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast and had seven heads and ten horns. And blasphemy against God were written all over it. We'll get to that in weeks to come. Notice how beautiful this woman is. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing, beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. Let me tell you something. When the Antichrist comes to power, It'll be a beautiful thing. I'm just being honest with you. When the church is raptured, the tribulation period starts, and the Antichrist comes to power, we're not talking about some horned dragon. We're talking about a good-looking, tanned, European, well-spoken, Armani suit, Mercedes, jewelry, loving everybody, teaching love, 
economic growth, money in your pocket. It's good days, medical care, everything you're going to need. It's going to be the best times this world has ever seen. It's going to come as this beautiful thing, and we're going to get sucked into it if we're left here. Now, we're going to be gone, right? So, I mean, we. But I can't do a we they. I, I'm not going to start judging this morning. The world. We, the world, will be sucked into it. Verse 4, I'm continuing. In her hands, she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. I thought about that, and I don't know. I'm just trying to interpret some of this the best I can with the help of the Holy Spirit. But she's got a goblet. She's, got, she's proud of this goblet. Proud of what I've been able to do. I'm tricked. Those old worthless believers. I've tricked them. I've deceived this world. Verse 5. A mysterious name was written on her forehead. Now see if it makes sense. Babylon the Great. So what is Babylon metaphorically? Babylon metaphorically represents a world in which apostasy rules. The truth is washed away. Anything goes. Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes. Why would Babylon be the mother of all prostitutes? Because it began thousands and thousands of years ago in Nimrod's day. Babylon represents a society that's focused more on wealth and itself than the truth. Verse 6, I could see that she was drunk. Drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. I don't know what Daniel saw in this dream, but let me just give you a few statistics from the Christian Freedom International related to verse 6. Over the last 10 years, these numbers have been gathered. Every five minutes, a Christian is martyred for their faith. More than 200 million followers around the world currently face persecution, making Christians the most persecuted faith group on the planet. Christians currently face persecution, get this, in 105 of the world's 196 countries on this planet. More Christians have been martyred for their faith in the 20th and 21st century alone than during the previous 19th, 19th centuries combined since Jesus died on the cross. We see some of it, but we don't hear much of it. It's not covered in the news a whole lot. That would be unpopular. We'll come back to more on that in the days to come. Now, we're going to talk a whole lot more about the Antichrist in messages to come. But, but do you begin to understand when the Bible says he's got this wonderful tongue, his strategy is not a hostile takeover. It's a romantic love affair with people. Just listen to me. I believe when the rapture takes place, one of the first things that will happen is, can't we just get along? We, we fought with religion enough. I mean, whether you want to worship the sun, the moon, the guard, the stars, Wicca, whatever you want, it's okay. I mean, th that's their faith. New age, old age, new ways, old ways. I'm not here advocating the old ways, guys. I'm not advocating the new ways. I'm in search of the truth. The old ways are not biblical. The new ways aren't biblical. I want the truth. Now, let's turn the page just a little bit, metaphorically speaking. Go back with me to Daniel 7. How many of you ever had, ever had to go to court? You ever had to go to court? We're not going to ask you a crime. Had to go to court before. You ever sit in a courtroom and you're waiting for the judge and it's noisy in there and it's kind of unruly and kind of chaotic but then an officer will stand up and he'll say all rise you can hear pin drop he will say the honorable George Stokes now presiding and there's something about 
the demeanor and the atmosphere in that courtroom that changes. We are reading right here just a snippet. Oh, we're going to get so many of them in the rest of Daniel. It's beautiful. Verse 9, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the Ancient One, or your Bible may say the Ancient of Days, sat down to judge. Now, this is a name. Let me tell you, if you don't know who this is, this is God the Father. We're going to see the Trinity so beautifully in the book of Daniel. This is God the Father. Why is he called the Ancient One of the Ancient of Days? Well, he existed before time began. He always has been and always will be. He has witnessed every crime against humanity. He knows every thought of every man and woman that's ever lived. He will be the ruling judge when Satan is held responsible for all the crimes that he has committed against you and I and against humanity. You see, when I want somebody to judge over my case, I want somebody who has all the facts. I don't want somebody that don't, only knows part of it. I want somebody who knows everything. And our Heavenly Father has been there. There is no beginning. He has no beginning. If we go back a gazillion years, He was there. He was there when you were born. He was there before your mama was born. He was there when Columbus came here. He was here when they crucified His Son. He was here when Moses was here. He was here when it flooded. He was here when Satan defaulted and was cast out of heaven. He was here when there was nothing. He is the Ancient One, and He is the only one qualified to take the throne and to render judgment. Let's read on. It's cool. it's cool. His clothes were white as snow. His hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. And a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Do you get this picture? It didn't say four or five. Millions of angels were ministering to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session. I wish I could just preach the rest of Daniel. We could stay to midnight tonight. Because I hate to leave you right here. Because it just gets so deep and rich. But I'm going to have to leave you right in the middle of this courtroom that's come into order. But the ancient one. Yes, there's a manipulator. There's a liar. And I'd love to turn over and read to you in chapter 11 where we win this thing. We're not going to be deceived. But you need to know and you and I need to know what is the attack that the Antichrist is going to pour out upon our world. And it is deception and lies and apostasy as this Babylonian metaphoric world of accepting everything. And what we have to battle against is to adhere to the truth. Hold to the truth. Because when court comes to session, the truth will be the guiding principle by which court will be held. And as long as we've adhered to the truth, we're fine. But when we walk away from the truth, we're in trouble. Last part of this. I can only touch on these last five words in the books. We're open. Notice that books is plural. We see that many times. And we'll talk about these books in the weeks to come. I can tell you one's the Lamb's Book of Life. Where you and I, our names are written in blood. My name's in the book. But there's books of deeds. There's books of things. That there's all kinds of books. I think what's important here when it says books are open. The ancient one has got a record. Now let me make this very personal and try to close this again. It's hard to close this chapter right here because it just keeps going. We've got to close it somewhere. Guys, as we go through life, I don't want to apologize ever for teaching the truth. Truth hurts, guys. The Bible says his words like a sword. and It pierces our spirit sometimes. Like, oh, man. Oh, oh, oh. Didn't need to hear that. But I need the truth. Because the sinful flesh wants to keep migrating away to this apostatic state. This world, guys, we need to understand and we need to wake up as believers of how we're being infiltrated, infiltrated 
infiltrated with witchcraft and sword. It, it breaks my heart to watch cartoons and movies nowadays that all the witchcraft and magic spells and, and all this sorcery that's going on in the name of entertainment and it's rated G because they don't say anything wrong and we just bring it in to the house by the droves and we do it innocently. And that's what makes this period of time in which we live so difficult because the Bible says be careful lest the very elect be deceived. Didn't catch it. And sometimes my wife and I will be talking. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep up with all of this. I don't know if I can keep watch on everything. And so I just have to go, Holy Spirit, be my guide. If there's something that I'm doing or participating in that is not right, show me. Show me. I don't want to stray from the truth because I know. And what I want you as God children to understand, we are in a very tricky time. Yes, we love the sinner. Yes, we want the, the broken to come. But we must stand for what is the truth. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. And we can stand for the truth and love the sinner at the same time. Loving the sinner doesn't mean we have to absorb what is wrong and dilute the truth. I can love you and tell you that your lifestyle is incorrect according to God's word. I can still love you and do that. Actually, if I really love you, I will do that. Because it's much easier to say, it's okay. I'm sure God will let that one slide. And then you stand before him someday and you're screaming, why didn't you tell me the truth? Because I'm found guilty before God. And you see, as we read Jeremiah, you remember how arrogant those women were. Jeremiah said, stop this. Go read the whole chapter. And they looked at him and said, we will not Stop worshiping the queen mother. We're going we're gonna to continue to offer idols. So we need to be aware. That's an awareness. And it should wake us up, if anything. But then I don't want you to miss 9 and 10. I want you to leave with 9 and 10. But there's a court that's going to take session. And every wrong that's ever been done to you, and every time the devil has brought pain into your life, do you understand all, all of these problems that we face in this world, and sometimes we look at it and go, why does God allow this to happen? It's because of sin, and sin came from the devil. And when he brought this in and deceived Adam and Eve, our world is broken, and it hurts. And we get, we, we're caught up in that hurt. But there is a day coming when the one who is guilty will be held accountable. And I can rest in that. The ancient one is going to hold court one of these days. And you and I don't have to worry about this court session as long as we know that they're covered under the blood of Jesus. But you know what? You can hang around the church all of your life and bake cookies for every Kairos event there ever is and say, well, I'm just going to let the chocolate chip cookies cover my sins. And you will be as lost as someone who has never stepped in the church. It's only the blood of Jesus. And guys and gals, moms and dads, we need to be teaching our children the truth. The truth. In love. In love. So how do you wrap this message up? Well, I guess you just do. I guess you go, this is intermission. We're going to go get popcorn or fried chicken or something. Come back next week. Continue reading this chapter. Let me tell you what you're going to see. We've seen God the Father. You're now about to see Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. He's going to be found worthy to come in and do something. And then we're about to get a gift. His children's about to get a gift in this chapter. Oh, it's a nice gift. We're about to inherit something we've been waiting for for a long, long, long time. Let me tell you something about prophecy or eschatology. Again, remember prophecy, it's already happened. Eschatology, things in the future. Sometimes when I used to hear the preacher say he's going to preach on prophecy, I didn't like it. It scared me. We have nothing to fear. Revelations and Daniel is the most, we ought to want to just soak it in to go, there is a better day coming. There is a new world coming. There is a time when the pain and suffering and sorrow is over. There's going to be a moment when the ancient one's going to step forward and hold court and he is going to set everything straight. But until that day, I must endure and hold on. And that's what we do. It's not scary. It's not, I mean, what's scary about 
If I said in 30 seconds, the rapture is going to take place. Hold on. 30 seconds. 29. 20. There's nothing scared. We're going to heaven. We're going to him. We're going to, we're going to a party the likes of which this world has no clue on. We're going with him. Nothing scary about that. Unless. If there's anything scary about it in your mind, it has to be because you're not ready. Well, then get ready. Get ready. You say, how did I get ready, Pastor? Let me tell you the truth. Truth is, in a nutshell, the Bible says that Jesus died for every man, woman, boy, and girl. The Bible says that it was his desire and his will that no one perishes. God doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all would come to him to find repentance, in repentance to find salvation. Well, how did I become a believer, Pastor? You acknowledge you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And you believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and that he died to pay the final price for your sin. And that his blood was shed for you. And you basically say, you know what? I believe you are who you say you are. See, that was the whole thing. That's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe that I am. See, that was the issue in John's day. The issue was they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And if you don't believe he is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God come to earth, then there is no salvation. That, that's the whole theological depth of John 3, 16. Do you believe that I am who I say I am? And if you believe that I am, and you let my blood cover your sins, then I will adopt you into my family. I will regenerate you. I will put a new life in you. My spirit will come in you. I will dwell in you. And you will have eternal life with me in paradise. And you have nothing to fear. It's not based on feeling. It's based on faith. I have placed my faith in him because I have no other vehicle. It's basically like going, how am I going to get out of this forsaken world? And I'm looking at all the options. And I go, Jesus Christ, that's the best one for me. I'm putting my faith in him. And you just jump in him. I'm going with him. Somebody says, well, what if you're wrong? So be it. I ain't found nothing better. I mean, I'm just being practical and real. I like what I hear. But I know it's true because he lives in my heart. And that's where this changes. Mark, if I eat a piece of chicken, you can't tell me it wasn't good because I ate it. I know. I tasted it. I know that serving God is good. It's not, it's not religion. I hear people say, well, I'm going to get religious someday. Fooey on that. Get you a relationship with a God who loves you. Let someone come into your heart and life and change you from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head and give you something that this world can't give you. It's not about following rules. It's about falling in love. That's the truth. And it's for anyone. Cost you nothing. But it cost you everything. 